The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly, so let's realign. Just listen and fill your mind. Hey guys, how's it going? And welcome to the morning star drive on 17.8. It is Wednesday, May 24th, and so happy for you joining us. And we are ready to start another day together with the Lord. So subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. Today we have an exciting podcast podcast for you. We have Health is Happiness, um, the biblical word study on the forming of the Old Testament, and of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world in this history today. All right, everyone, how are you doing? I hope you guys have had uh, an amazing beginning of the week. We're right in the middle, smack in the middle. It is Wednesday. We have Wednesday service tonight. And uh, if you haven't yet, leave a like or a comment to build our community. Uh, Both likes and uh, comments they're perfect. It is a good way of communication. And sometimes I know there's people out there that actually uh, DM me privately. That's cool too. But really happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive and on weekends now too. So let's get up, support each other each and every day. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy and excited that we have all these programs coming out. You know, we had Man Cave on Monday. Love and Life second episode came out on Tuesday. Uh, and now we're here on Wednesday. You know, of course, I'm not going to put on any episodes tonight because we have uh, the Wednesday service. But tomorrow we're going to also see uh, the Pravi Puff Girls. And that uh, episode two, I believe, will come out uh, tomorrow. So I'm excited about that also. Either way. All right. So, um, oh, One thing I do have to remind everyone, uh, as usual, there's service tonight. Make sure to pray for your leaders so they can preach well. Also, to make sure to give some good feedback to, uh, you know, one of the things that, one of the reasons why you should be praying for your leaders is because how your leader preaches and how fiery they preach with the Holy Spirit will determine your destiny for each and every week, right? It determines how inspired you get. It determines and when when you are really inspired to take action and you do, then those actions of the week will det- uh, determine the destiny of that week, solve your issues and problems, and bring you closer to God also. So make sure you really, really pray for your leaders. Now, um, I had this question uh, from some newcomers. Right? Not newcomers, new members. And, uh, you know, this is a question I get a lot, right? And the question is always like, uh, they, they tell me like, oh, there's such a difference between learning the word, like the Bible studies that we teach, and then, also, and then all of a sudden switching to coming to service every week, right? And here's the interesting thing. The majority of uh, new members that I've talked to that have passed and everything else, and they come to service for the first, second, third time, and like they've been doing it for a month or two, they kind of like... Uh, sheepishly come to me like, hey, Pastor Sky, I feel so bad about this, but I really have a hard time with the Sunday services, right? And the reason is because they're like, oh, I just don't feel the impact. It's not as powerful as the Bible study. And they feel like it's so different. Like I listen to the Bible study, all that impact and power. I realize this history. And then all of a sudden, everything turns into something very, very slow. And, um, you know, there's something I think that almost everyone struggles with. Not everyone, but a lot of people struggle with. And I totally get it because I was kind of similar too, right? And the way that Sunsi puts it is like this. Uh, When you learn the Bible study, the Bible study only has like what? You only learn like 20 to 30 lessons, right? And it's a sprint. It is short. It is impactful and powerful. Why? The purpose of the Bible studies is different than the purpose of the the Sunday messages and the weekly, weekly messages. The purpose of the Bible study is to help you to realize this history, right? That's like, you know, that's like, it's the same as, uh, well, it's a little bit longer, but when you go to a church, like a former faith church, they preach the gospel in that one message, people come to Christ kind of thing, right? It's that short, impactful, emotional time. Okay, so think about the Bible study you're learning as a sprint because it has to do with the purpose of it. Now, the thing that Sunday talks about when it comes to weekly messages, the weekly messages are a marathon, right? And the difference is it's for the rest of your life, right? So like, you know, for me, I came to this history. I've already been in this history for 25 years. Already just looking at my life now with the the Sunday messages, 25 years worth of Sunday messages, pre-dawn messages, Wednesday messages, Friday prayer meetings, 25 years worth. So how many messages is that compared to doing 20 to 30 lessons for Bible study and then realizing? It took me like what? uh, Half a year for me to pass. 
compared to 25 years that's ongoing. So you have to look at the weekly messages as a marathon because it's for the rest of your life, right? In the end, the most important part is not the crazy powerful realizations you get from the Bible studies. No, that gets you in the door. But ultimately, for the next 40, 50, 60, sometimes 70, 80 years, people need to deal with the daily life faith. What is the walk that you take together with God every single day? And guess what? It's not going to be super hyper like realization, pow, pow, explosion. Oh, clouds are people. Oh my gosh, fire is the word. Oh, and then all everyone's like, you know, it's like you're freaking out like this is so crazy. No, this is kind of similar to marriage, right? And it's very fitting because we're in the time period of bride and bridegroom, right? So when you get married, the honeymoon stage is short, but passionate and powerful. However, after that honeymoon stage of like several months, whatever it is, you need to live for the next decades, dozens, you know, like like 20, 30, 40, 50 years back home, working, making a living, paying your bills, all the monotonous things in life. And you're with each other for every single day, which is much slower difficult at times, learning about each other even more, how to live with e- uh, each other, learning more about each other, how to live with each other. Like we're learning so much more during that time. Why? Because it's far longer than that honeymoon stage. See, everyone can survive the honeymoon stage of faith, but it's about the daily faith that makes or breaks people in their life. That's the most important part. And this is why a lot of people's minds go in the wrong direction because their expectation is the same as the Bible study. And they're like, oh my gosh, well, I felt it so much during Bible study, but I don't feel it during the Sunday message or whatever it is, right? And that's because they don't realize the difference and the purpose between the two. There is a different purpose between the two. And this is kind of how people start to uh, get on the wrong track. Because they have this different, expe- a wrong expectation of how we're supposed to be living at that time. So that's why your mind uh, has to make that switch. And I don't think it's any different. Like we go through these switches in life all the time, right? So we go from a sprint to a marathon, which means uh, long term as compared to the short term or the sprint. And it's about the living daily step by step, right? No one can sprint a marathon right? The the marathon is like a hundred times longer, maybe even a thousand times longer than a sprint, right? But when you become really, really good at running and doing marathons, then what happens is you can run a sustained period of time at maybe an 80% speed of a sprint, but you could do it for hours, right? And that's where you need to get to. Right. A lot of people like kind of give up and like, oh, it's too hard. The daily life is too hard. You got to work on it just like any other muscle. And you have to get yourself to that level where you're at a near sprint, but you're doing it for hours and hours and hours for an entire marathon. It's like, what, 26 miles or whatever it is. Right. So that's one thing that we do have to recognize is uh, there has to be that switch in the mind, that switch, that change that happens from a sprint to a marathon, but realizing the purpose between the two things, between the message and the Sunday message, right? The, the, the Bible study and the Sunday message. And this is, if people don't adjust quickly, um, people will all of a sudden start thinking like, oh, I think the former faith was better for me. Right. But that means they they haven't really grasped, right, how big the daily life is. Right. The daily life is the biggest part. And, you know, sometimes people will feel like really, uh, oh, my gosh, why is my life like this? Or I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm in the new history, but why does it feel so hard or why does it feel like this? And the answer is everything is hard in the beginning. Everything. It doesn't matter. Everything's hard in the beginning. So I I don't think it's anything different from the way the world is. Whenever something is new, whenever something is shiny and bright, yeah, in the beginning, you're like, oh my gosh. And then you have to go through the real trudge, right? You have to trudge through it, right? And I think that is something that people do have to understand and realize really well. And we kind of have to get these, uh, I do think it's something that we have to prepare the new members for, right? That, hey, it's going to be different now. Why? We're going, uh, we're going through the trudge, right? We're going through the mud first so that we can get into the meadow, 
right? And the ultimate thing we're doing here is trying to live the way that God wants us to live. Not the way that we think is the right way. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I don't think we should live like this. No, that's not why we go to church. We don't go to church and like, well, God loves us anyways, even if I don't do pre dawn And that's your thinking. That basically is just your thinking, right? Uh, to make yourself feel better about it. But, you know, you have to get yourself into the mindset of what God wants, you know. And this is exactly what um, everyone in each testament, in each time period has been trying to do is to get into God's mindset. How does God want me to live, right? So I do think that is a big thing that we have to uh, prepare the new members for too. Uh, so today, uh, during this time here, I really want to talk about um, one thing that someone was uh, asking me in the comment section is like they really, really agreed to me about the meetings inside Providence and how like, oh, they're so long and they're so long-winded and it feels like there's no purpose to it and stuff like that too, right? And uh, for me as a head leader, this was something that was really big for, it was a big thing for me too, but I didn't really realize it until much later, right? And, but you know, when you're a leader, the long meetings, you're fine with it because, you know, your, your heart is all set on Providence and you can go, you know, these meetings as long as they're beneficial, whatever it is, right? But, you know, when I was, uh, before going to these meetings, you know, some, you know, don't you guys dread these long drawn out meetings and you don't know when the end is like, there is no end. You never see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Some men, like two hours, two and a half hours. Three, it's crazy. No one knows when it's going to end. And like, yeah, you don't see an ending and it's so inefficient because, you know, this is kind of why, um, do you know, like if you understand why, like say in the workforce, why they say that uh, nine to five is the best optimum time for people to be efficient, right? Because there's research done. In the past, people working all day, all night, but there comes a point where there's a point of diminishing returns, which means that you can work like really solidly for a certain amount of time, but after you get you become low in energy. And there comes a point where even if you go longer, your returns will get lower and lower and lower, right? And that's why there's an optimal point where people are able to be efficient, proficient, and able to do things at a high level, right? And <clears throat> like for meetings too, how many times, like you guys can you guys can comment on this, how many times are you in a meeting that's so long and the only thing you can think about is when will it end? You don't care about what's being said anymore, right? And, you know, you end up in a meeting that's so long that only the people who talk a lot are constantly talking about a bunch of things. And no one is interested because they just want to leave. It's just way too long and you're tired kind of thing, right? Because a lot of people come to meetings after work. A lot of, they come to meetings after school or everything else like that. So for me, when I was a head leader, now I'm not saying I did this from the beginning. I probably did this in my last year as a head leader because I'm like, what is going on? Why are, you know, these meetings, like people, it's inefficient and people don't really like it. People are on their phones, you know, they're not really paying attention. So I started to research about uh, proper meetings. And I think this is a skill that a lot of leaders should be learning to, right? So uh, one, there's a couple of things that I, uh, I understood. And there's four, there's like four different things that I implemented into these meetings, right? Looking at the problems that we had and researching and, and seeing that a lot of companies have these same problems. A lot of organizations have these problems too, where no one even wants to be at the meeting, right? So here's a couple of things that I will present to you guys so you guys could take a look at this. So number one, uh, there has to be a set time. There has to be a set time for the meeting. It is put in stone. For me, uh, I used one hour and five minutes. And five minutes is because, you know, you have that prayer time and that, you know, prayer doesn't last five minutes. But of course, you have that, those little in-between times, right? Where it's kind of like, oh, you know, something is said or in between the, the, the subjects or whatever, topics, whatever, right? So I put one hour and five minutes, right? And prayer from the very beginning, and then we get into our topics. Now, this set time is something that I promise, like, even if the meeting is like, we still have a topic, I will cut it off at, at uh, uh, probably around uh, an hour and three to four minutes so we can pray at the very end. I, I, I promise it, right? The set time that I promise is one hour and five minutes, 
right? Which means that people will always know that there's an ending. People will always know is, oh man, we don't have a lot of time, so let's really get into this. So even after the meetings, people are able to set their next appointments, meet newcomers, meet their family, because the meeting's exactly 7 p.m. to 8.05 p.m. and we're done. You guys can go to eat, do the things that you need to do. You're not really looking at your watches all the time, right? So since I promised to keep the meetings to one hour and five minutes, I ask the people to keep a promise to never come late, right? No one comes in late. And honestly, uh, if I, if I were to be like, you know, because I know that there's like these really bad habits that we have in Providence, I'm not sure why, but it, it could be just people have these bad habits in general, is a lot of people just come late. They just, you know, stroll in like no, nothing's wrong with it, right? Now, I'm not saying that it's so strict, like you have to be here on time because I do know sometimes there's traffic. Sometimes you have to stay late at work. Sometimes, there's all these different things here, but I do, as a sign of respect, I do expect people to, to call in early and say, hey, I'm sorry, this thing popped up. I'll be a little bit late and that's fine, right? But if people don't even call, have the courtesy to call, uh, have the respect to, I don't let it, like they'll, they'll wait outside until that portion of the topic is done and then they can come in after, right? When the next, next topic comes in so we don't have any uh, interruptions, right? So that's the first thing I do is it's a set time. Every week, same time. I expect everyone to be there on time, right? And on time for me, uh, and I tell everyone this is on time is 10 minutes earlier, why? You need time to settle in, go to the bathroom, right? You sit down, you get your, you know, you pray, settle in first. You need some time. So being on time is not coming in at like 7 p.m. on the dot. It is coming at 6.50, get yourself settled, and then we start the meeting exactly at uh, exactly at 7 p.m. And those of you guys don't know, like even for me when it comes to meetings, uh, I never start late. That's the set time. I ne- even if there's one person, even if zero people are there, I'll start the meeting, right? I will not allow people to feel, I will not allow the people who come early to be punished for coming early. The people who should be punished are those that come late, which basically means I start right at seven and those that are there will make the decision, right? That's just the way it is, right? When you go to work, who goes late? No one goes to late to work. If you go to late, you know, if you're someone going um, going late to work, you're going to get fired. You're going to get all these, like, uh, you get reprimanded and stuff too. So that's one of the big things I set at time. And I always start on time. If you guys look at all my uh, Bible studies and all the meetings that I have, I will start exactly on time. Exactly. So people, you know, we, people will never have to worry about, oh no, I have my next meeting. What's going to happen here? Oh, we're going to be late. I don't want that to happen. So mine is, my first thing is set time. Hour, that for me was hour and five minutes. Hour and five minutes. Uh, second rule that I have in my meetings is to keep productivity and efficiency, there's no phones in the meetings, zero. You turn off your phones and you put them in the middle of the table. And the reason they put in the middle of the table is because if you're going to check your phone, you have to reach into the middle, which means everyone sees it kind of thing, right? I put the phones in the middle, turned off, middle of the table, right? And this... and For this, the reason why it's important is because um, if you're working or if you're in class, who answers their phone? Imagine you're working, you're going to answer your phone in the middle of talking to a client. No, right? You have a set schedule. And think about this. People are so into their phones. They're like, oh, no, but what if I don't answer? If you don't answer, you don't answer. And guess what? 90% of the text messages that come to you are just, what are you doing? You don't even need to answer it. Right? You just answer it after. Oh, sorry, I had a meeting. And it's fine. But people, for some reason, put like such a priority on their phones. It makes no sense to me, right? So you don't, when you don't have a phone, nothing's distracting you, right? It hinders productivity and efficiency. And people can, all I want is absolute focus for that one hour and five minutes. And that's it. No phones in meetings, right? That's all I'm asking is for an hour and five minutes. Third uh, thing that I do for meetings, and these are all stuff that I research, is you need an agenda that goes out early. So, you know, I will sit down with uh, other leaders, uh, maybe like the assistant leaders, whatever it is, and we will set up an agenda. And the agenda goes out about two, three, two to three days before the meeting. Why? 
people need time to prepare for the topics. I don't want any popcorn meetings where people are just off the top of their head coming up with certain things. Right? People need to think about it, the pros and cons, come up with a really solid idea where we can really discuss it. Right? A real discussion isn't just starting with, hey, what do you about what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Hey, and then we're then everyone's gonna start talking about pros and cons, but then people are gonna feel bad, like, oh, no one listens to me because they all talk about the cons. And the answer is if you re- if you prepared earlier, you would understand the cons. It wouldn't be a bad thing. You would lay everything out, right? And in the ag- agenda, it includes the time for each topic. Today, we're going to talk about how to run a meeting, 15 minutes. Next, then we're going to talk about uh, uh, newcomer education, 20 minutes. Next, we're going to have like a, a workshop on this. Next, right? And I have a timer for the agenda and I have a timer for the entire meeting so we finish in an hour and five minutes, right? The agenda is important and the promise comes out. Another promise comes out is I give this to you, you got to be prepared, right? If you're going to be a leader, leaders don't just come to meetings. The meeting starts way before the meeting. You have to prepare for it, right? And, you know, of course, if it's an education, it's different because you're just listening to an education. But um, if we're going to go to a meeting, we're discussing things, people need to be ready. And the leaders have to play their parts in uh, the agenda, what topics come out, making sure everyone prays and goes over these things, write, writes their notes on paper or print them out, whatever it is, because phones are going to be turned off anyways, right? So that's that's another thing that we have to think about. Uh and the last one, I think that it's very, very important uh, is if there ever comes a time where we need a little bit more time, everyone has to be asked first and no one is, no one has to stay for it. They don't because, you know, we have, you know, we make the promise hour and five minutes. People have a schedule, go to your schedule. But if some people want to talk a little bit more, then we have to ask permission. Like, hey guys, uh, we're probably gonna need about another five minutes for this. Is everyone okay for another five minutes? Right, and then when people say yes, they say, "Oh, can we do it next year, next week?" That's fine, right? And one thing that I think is very good with human beings, and the reason why I put it to a shorter time, like why not an hour and a half, two hours? The shorter is, uh, people don't feel burdened, and the second thing is, uh, one thing about human beings is this, and you got to let me know that just because you have more time doesn't mean you'll spend more time. In most cases, human beings procrastinate. And the weird thing is when they have a deadline, they'll get it done, but they'll usually use like the last three days to do it, even though they have seven, right? So it's not like human beings are not capable of doing things in a shorter amount of time, right? Longer is not always better, especially for human beings that procrastinate and don't do it this way. Short and super focused can get more done in a lot of, a lot of situations. So that's kind of what I implemented for, uh, my church in the last year of my, uh, head leading. And I felt it was way more efficient and productive. People didn't feel like it was going to drag out. People didn't feel like, Oh my gosh. You know, like they were like, it's only an hour and five minutes. That's it. Right. And it forces people to think deeply and, and thinking in discussions in that short amount of time. Uh, and people get focused for that one hour, knowing that there's an ending and knowing that time is very, very short. So I think it's something that is very beneficial. Uh, I'm not saying use the exact same like time limits that I use, but I would definitely, I would definitely, definitely um, consider leaders or uh, people who are running meetings to think about it in this way. The worst thing you can, the worst type of meeting you can go to is a meeting you don't know when the end is. It drags out. There's no agenda and you're just wondering what, like, I, I know the habits of leaders. Why? Because sometimes I'll visit regions. I'll, 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 I'll say, hey, you need, a, you need an agenda. And they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do the agenda. And one time I was in this region for months, never saw an agenda once, even though I said this is going to be the best way to do it. Right, and they and if they said we're not going to do it, then I'm fine because it's their choice as the leader not to have an agenda. But if they say they're going to do it, and months go by and you've never seen a single agenda, that's something I look at and like, ugh, ugh, right? Like that's it's total. Like there's no accountability, there's no integrity at that point, right? So it's something that if you're going to do it, you got to do it, right? Don't sit there and say let's wait five more minutes for more people to come. No, start your meetings, right? So. That's something I hope that you guys can, it makes you think more deeply about, yeah, this is how our meetings can become better, 
right? Having better meetings. And I think that's something that's very, very important uh, for our churches too, okay? <clears throat> oh, and last thing before we go into the break, someone actually asked this question. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, it was Hermione. I, I guess it's someone from Harry Potter, right? But uh, this is my last time I'm going to talk about farts this week. <laughs> this week, like for a while, right? But someone's curious about what the, you know, my sermon on farts, right? My first sermon on farts. They're asking, what was the point? Like, what's the call to action in that sermon, right? And I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't remember very well. I don't remember. I do remember talking about uh, like something about like... Uh, Knowing what makes a fart smell, and it's supposed to be something called a sulfite that's found in certain types of foods like meats and like certain vegetables and stuff like that. And in my head, I'm probably thinking it went something like, you know, like, you know, if you don't know, then you will misunderstand people who have smelly farts because you don't know that it's about sulfites, right? About what you eat. And in the same way, you need to know the word clearly so you don't misunderstand God. Inspiring, isn't it? <laughs> See, I don't even know if that was what it is, but that's just something that comes off the top of my head. Either way, guys, with that, uh, with that to end, uh, let's get into our first break. So let's get into today's word study uh, on this wonderful Wednesday. And of course, every single Wednesday, we do go into uh, 
what do you call it? A biblical word study. So we go into certain topics, whether it's on the scriptures that we, the scriptures of the week, going into a little bit more deeply, or who wrote which books, uh, how, you know, the, the historical or political backgrounds of what's going on. And today I want to talk to you about the Old Testament. And this is not talked a lot about, but I was just listening to a podcast and I thought it was quite interesting because, you know, a lot of people are, are more focus on the New Testament. And when we talk about, oh, how did the Bible come to be? Oh, well, there's the Old Testament. And then you start talking about the canonization of the New Testament and how the New Testament formed kind of thing, right? But a lot of people don't know uh, how the Old Testament came to be. And I think this is also uh, a very important thing for us to know, right? Both Old Testament and New Testament. So, <clears throat> you know, the Old Testament was, you know, it's it's been around for thousands of years already, Right, and it contains accounts like stretching back to the beginning of time, like Adam and Eve. Right, and it's basically an ancient collection of books uh, that provides a foundation for both Judaism, Christianity, and of course for this history too in Providence. Right, so where did it come from? Right, how did these stories, these commandments, make their way uh, to where it is right now? Okay, so let's get into like the background, history, archaeology, and the formation of the Old Testament time. Okay, so. <clears throat> when was the Old Testament written and who wrote it? So when you think about the Old Testament, it's a collection of different books, different works. And the Old Testament was composed over many years, numerous authors, and the texts that comprise the Old Testament uh, are believed to have been written over a thousand, over a thousand year period, spanning from the mid-second to the first uh, millennium BC. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So while the New Testament understands God to be the author of the Old Testament, like by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, we also have to realize, physically speaking, there's at least 40 different writers that have been identified as authors for the entire Bible itself, right? And, you know, of course, we know that who are these ancient scribes of the Old Testament? We know the Moseses, the Davids, Solomons, and stuff like that, too. Or, or there was, you know, lesser known um, people that are like Hebrew women, like as Deborah or Miriam and non-Hebrews like Agur and Lemuel, okay? So how was it written? How was the Old Testament written? So the text of the Old Testament was originally recorded in two languages. So everyone know that the, uh, should know this really well. The original, uh, the Old Testament was originally recorded in two languages, classical Hebrew and imperial Aramaic. Hebrew and Aramaic. Of course, the New Testament is all in Greek, right? So Old Testament's Hebrew and Aramaic. And... In the Old Testament, you're going to find like five basic types of uh, literary genres, right? Like like law, we know that in the first five books, with historical narrative, which is in like, you know, Genesis, Exodus, and some other, other prophets. Then we have poetry, like Song of Songs, uh, wisdom, and prophetic utterance. Those are the five different literary genres that are contained in the Old Testament. Law, historical narrative, poetry, wisdom, and uh, prophetic utterance. <clears throat> now, people in the ancient Near East, uh, they used a lot of different materials to write, you know, to, to write on, like the different writing surfaces. So, like, monumental inscriptions were preserved on rock walls or stone slabs. Like, these are the ones that are like, you know, like the Ten Commandments kind of thing, right? Like, you'll find it on the Rosetta Stone. You guys can take a look at the Rosetta Stone, uh, the Moabite Stone. They're well-known examples of documents carved in solid rock, right? And, of course, like I just said, the Ten Commandments, we know they were in, carved in tablets of stone, all right? Now, other ancient writing materials that they got the Old Testament from includes clay, or even wooden tablets, papyrus manuscripts, and scrolls, right? And sometimes they use parchment made from tanned animal skins, but these were all used uh, to write with, write on, okay? So like, if you look at the scroll of Jeremiah, uh, it was burned by King uh, Jehoiakim, and it most likely was papyrus or parchment, one of the two, right? Uh, sometimes they use something called ostraca, which is like uh, broken pieces of pottery, and they were commonly used as an inexpensive writing material uh, throughout the ancient Near East, but they're not really mentioned in the Old Testament, right? So, you know, like, beaten metal scrolls were occasionally used for special purposes, copper scrolls. Uh, like, copper scrolls are actually found among some of the writings left in the caves uh, along the Dead Sea, right? So, like, the Dead Sea scrolls and such. And... Uh, the Old Testament doesn't, like, we know that's what they wrote on, but there's no mention of what type of ink that was used for writing on scrolls. 
It lists some of the materials the authors use, like um, uh, in the Old Testament, it talks about an iron stylus, a reed pen, a pen knife for sharpening the pens, a writing case. Like it kind of tells us like little hints about it. We don't know ex exactly what type of ink was used, right? And one thing that we have to take into consideration is because it was so hard, it was such a challenge of hand, you know, there was no printing press, right? Everything was hand copied. The ancient world placed, this is why, because it was so hard to have uh, hand copying uh, texts, the ancient world placed a premium on hearing, memorizing, and publicly reading documents, Right? And this is why there's an emphasis on hearing the words of the Lord in the Old Testament. And the written works were often spread through servants like message runners, heralds, and scribes. But you kind of get an idea why with this type of, uh, this type of culture and thinking, it, like the, even the New Testament wasn't written so quickly, right? It was, into, it was just too hard to make hand copy text. It just took too much time. That's why it was all about hearing, memorizing, and publicly read documents, right? <clears throat> now, we look at the Old Testament texts and their versions. Uh, over the last several centuries, um, well, not over the last several centuries, but over several centuries during the time of the Old Testament times, so way back in the ancient times, the Old Testament has been copied and translated countless times. There are literally thousands of copies available in different languages from various time periods. And naturally, uh, the extended hand copying process created errors of transmission, right? So sometimes people are going to make mistakes as they're doing hand copying. It's not going to be through a printing press where it's perfect every single time. So these human errors, uh, whether of what they see, they hear, uh, whether what they wrote, memory, judgment, are called variants or variant readings of the text. So there's something, there's a new, not a new science, but a science called, uh, uh, when you compare it, it's called textual criticism, is when you compare the different variants, Right? And uh, sometimes it's not textual criticism, or they'll sometimes they'll call it lower biblical criticism. But the goal of textual criticism is to sort through the various versions of the Old Testament and get as close to the original as possible, right? So the practice or methodology of textual criticism includes gathering, sorting, evaluating uh, the variant readings of a given verse or passage of Scripture, right? So... They'll look at all the available uh, manuscript data and then it's rated to select the most appropriate reading of the text in question based on the available data, right? So that's why sometimes you'll see in the Old Testament, you'll see like footnotes that tell you like, oh, um, there is some type of textual criticism in this one. It might mean something else or something along that line. You'll find that in your Bible. Some points there's going to be, uh, because of textual criticism, it'll tell you it was also written as this, Right? And, you know, sometimes people are going to say, oh, there's so many textual variants of the Old Testament, and this is evidence that's saying that there's no integrity of the Bible, the Old Testament. But, you know, you have to understand that uh, with it, given its antiquity and the Old Testament exhibits uh, a remarkable state of preservation, right? And this is due in part of the meticulous copying procedures of the Hebrew and Christian scribes and the early and wide distribution of biblical manuscripts and the reverence for and commitment to the Bible as in this inspired word of God. So they had to do it perfectly, right? It is by both Hebrews and Christians alike. And it's equally important. Um, you know, of course, uh, we have to realize it wasn't just them. It was the Holy Spirit inspiring them, these human writers, Right. And uh, they went over like kind of the canonization process, right? So here's a question is how do we decide or how do they decide what belongs in the Old Testament? And the, the truth is we don't know a lot about the exact process that resulted in a fixed Hebrew canon. We just don't. And unfortunately, we have no ancient documents from the scribes detailing the various steps of the procedure that culminated into the Hebrew Bible. But there are two things that are certain. Number one is the process was lengthy and involved. So it took a lot of time and a lot of people were involved discussions, right? And the second thing is it probably took place in stages over several centuries of Hebrew history. So the limited data that we have fits with the generic outline of canon formation, right? So those of you guys don't know what canon means, right? The word canon... It's not something you'll find in the Bible, but the root word occurs from 1 Kings chapter 14, right? 
And the origin, it's, uh, it's a word in Hebrew that means reed or stalk of papyrus, oil grass, or sweet cane, right? And since reeds were used as measuring rods or ruling sticks for making straight lines, cannon came to mean measure or measuring reed, right? So the term cannon was first used as a theological expression to reference the Holy Scriptures um, by like a bishop in Alexandria. And that was like, that was like during the time of the Roman persecution. Well, this is right after, this is during the time of Constantine, around uh, like, 300, like 300, 400 uh, AD, right? Uh, and this is, uh, who's the bishop? Who's the bishop? Who's, uh, who's the bishop? Let me just check here. Uh, the bishop is Athanasius. Athanasius, the bishop of Alexandria. And he had an Easter letter to the churches and he outlined the contents of the New Testament canon. And that's like 367 AD. Right, But if you apply it to the Hebrew scriptures, canon implies that the individual books of the Old Testament were believed to have been divinely inspired and recognized as word of God. Right, So the canon was a collection of books of scripture deemed supremely authoritative for faith and religious practice by the Hebrew community and became the standard by which later books of Hebrew history, tradition, and religious teachings were evaluated, right? So that's what a canon is, right? So stage one of a canon, when you're making a canon, in most cases... Uh, uh, you know, you, they're taking in God's revelation to the Hebrew people. It was initially conveyed orally, right? So if you look at the Old Testament time, all of it was done orally. God says this and God says that. And you'll see that, you know, all over the, the prophets in the New Old Testament time will all say, God told me this kind of thing, right? And these authoritative utterances were then passed to succeeding generations as the word of the Lord in the form of received oral tradition, right? So there's the first one is when you're taking can something canonized, remember, because it was an oral tradition, people would pass down the things that God said to a certain prophet, right? Or a king or a judge, whatever it is, right? Uh, stage two of it, um, after understanding this, we'll go into a stage two, which is called a formal written document. And... What's going to happen is at some point in time, this oral tradition will go to written document, right? These divinely inspired words, saying speeches, whatever it was, they were passed orally. But at a certain point in time, they're going to be recorded and preserved for the entire Hebrew community uh, to, to, to read later on. So on occasion, the authoritative utterance and the writing uh, or uh, of these scriptures uh Sometimes it actually happened simultaneously. Sometimes it did. Like it was said and written at the same time, right? Like uh, Jeremiah's oracle to King Jehoiakim, right? Uh, in other instances, the documentation of divine revelation took place sometime after the historical event or circumstance prompting the word of the Lord. So, you know, oftentimes that uh, the event or circumstance is provided as part of the context for God's communication to Israel. And then stage three is collecting the written documents, Right? So, you know, if you look at the uh, a millennium of Hebrew history is recorded in the Old Testament, right, which indicates the canonization process likely took a long time, right? Because, you know, if, if the history is a thousand years, then you'd have to have wait those, you know, it would have to be made at least take at least a thousand years because you have to wait for the history to pass in order for you to start uh, writing about it too, right? So it did take a very, very long time. <laughs> and then assembling the written records uh, of the Hebrew experience with Yahweh into anthologies and books was partially a matter of convenience for the Israelite community, right? So, because that means, you know, from that point, it gives you easy access to documents and it, could, it, it, it ensures preservation of the history of the Hebrew people. And then stage four is sorting the written documents and fixing a canon, right? So like the Hebrews, uh, I think they apparently fixed a, uh, fixed a canon, of scripture well before the time of Jesus Christ, right? And that's why you had the Septuagint, which was the Old Testament that was uh, translated into Greek, which means it had to be done before Jesus came, right? So uh, it, it, it seems, it, and, and, and the books of the Old Testament were written in three parts. It was the law, the prophets, and the other books of our fathers, right? And uh, Jesus himself appealed to a threefold Hebrew canon consisting of the law, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's how, how Jesus appealed to uh, Jesus appealed to it, and it seems that there were at least four key periods during the Old Testament history when sorting documents and fixing a canon would have been crucial for the Hebrew religious community. Right, 
So number one would be during the time of the Sinai experience when Moses was, you know, in Mount Sinai. That would be a huge time to canonize uh, and, and put it into like chronological order. Uh, during the shift from theocracy to mon monarchy, which is a time of, uh, that would be the time of uh, a Samuel, right? Samuel, when uh, Samuel uh, appointed the first king, so it went from theocracy to mon mon a monarchy. And then at the time of the fall of Jerusalem, sub subsequent exile in Babylon, so there's another big one. And as part of the reforms of Ezra uh, and Nehemiah, the the post-exilic Jerusalem. So those would be the four major times that they were kind of going into this canonization, putting it into order and making sure that they have like uh, a written history uh, in an organized way, right? Now, in order for them in the Old Testament time to select a canon, like how do you select a book to put into the canon? So there would be like the text had to be divinely inspired. Uh, authorship was a key factor, right? Uh, in evaluating the books, who, who was the writer, and the content of the individual books was examined for internal consistency. And of course, last one is the documents the Hebrew religious community actually used influence canon selection. And that's, that's a big thing for the New Testament too. There were so many letters and books that were flying around during the time of the early Christian church, but to canonize was using the ones that were most readily used. Like th that was a big part of the canonization, right? So what are the four reasons? Number one, it had to be divinely inspired. It had the authors it had to be, have the right authors. Uh, the content was examined for internal consistency. And of course, it had to be uh, texts that were commuted, like the religious community were actually using, right? And this is how uh, the Old Testament came to be. So you got to think about this. For thousands of years, the Old Testament has largely remained true to its original form, right? We don't know exactly how the original Hebrew books were selected, like we don't know, yeah, we don't we don't have that information, but we have every reason to believe that the decisions were guided by the same Holy Spirit who, you know, basically inspired the canonization of the of the the New Testament too, right? So together, the written works represent a body of oral history that ancient Hebrews relied upon, lived out, and remembered daily, right? <coughs> so there it is, guys. That is uh, how the Old Testament came to be, and I hope it's something that helps you guys out, and it's something that uh, you guys can you know, think about for your future also. Like whenever people ask about these things, we need to be knowledgeable about the book that we think is the book of life. All right? So there it is, guys. That's the word study for today. Hope you guys really enjoyed it. So let's get into our second break.
Okay, so uh, here we are to the last segment on today's podcast. I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed everything thus far. And of course, every Wednesday, we do have Health is Happiness, and I'm looking forward to this once again. This is Dr. Zinni with part two of Health Tips for Those in Their 40s. Hi everyone, it's Dr. Zinni here, and welcome to another episode of Health is Happiness. Today we are resuming part two, health tips in your 40s. Last time, we talked about all the interesting changes that age has on our bodies. We talked about our connective tissues and skin, as well as changes in our metabolism and hormones as we age. And you did hear it right last episode. We can no longer blame our unwanted weight gain on our slowed metabolism anymore, at least not until we're 60 years of age or older. So last time we started talking about our loss of muscle mass in our 40s. Yes, we lose muscle mass as we age. So what do we do about it? So you want to be ramping up your protein intake and increasing your resistance workouts to combat this. Physically inactive people can lose as much as 3 to 5% of muscle every decade after age 30. After the age of 40, you lose muscle mass, which is the main calorie burning engine in your body, at a rate of 1% a year, approximately. It's linked to the dropping estrogen and testosterone levels that accompanies aging. Age related muscle loss is called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia reduces your strength, mobility, and balance, and increases your risk of falls and low trauma fractures. One contributor to sarcopenia is the natural decline of testosterone, the hormone that stimulates protein synthesis and muscle growth. Some research has shown that supplemental testosterone can add lean body mass, that is muscle, in older men, but there can be adverse effects. Plus, the FDA has not approved of these supplements specifically for increasing muscle mass in men. Therefore, the best means to build muscle mass, no matter what your age is, is progressive resistance training. This means you gradually amp up your workout volume, whether it's increasing weight, increasing reps, or sets, as your strength and endurance improve. Your diet also plays a role in building muscle mass. Protein is the king of muscle food. The body breaks it down into amino acids, which it uses to build muscle. However, older men often experience a phenomenon called anabolic resistance, which lowers their body's ability to break down and synthesize protein. Therefore, with resistance training, as you get older, you need more of it. A recent study in the journal Nutrients suggests a daily intake of 1 to 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight for older adults who do resistance training. For example, a 175-pound man would need about 75 to 100 grams of protein a day. And then you'd want to divide that protein equally among your meals to maximize muscle protein synthesis. As I mentioned earlier, your body can absorb more than a certain amount of protein anyway. Animal sources such as meat, eggs, and milk are considered the best as they provide the proper ratios of all the essential amino acids. Yet you want to stay away from red and processed meat because of the high levels of saturated fat and additives. Instead, opt for healthier choices such as 3.5 ounces of lean chicken or salmon, which gives about 30 grams of protein, 6 ounces of plain Greek yogurt, which is about 17 grams, 1 cup of skim milk, which is about 9 grams, or 1 cup of cooked beans, about 18 grams. Protein powders can also offer about 30 grams per scoop and can be added to all kinds of meals, like oatmeal, shakes, and yogurt. While food sources are the best supplemental protein, protein powders can help if you struggle with consuming enough protein from your regular diet. Also, to maximize muscle growth and improve recovery, you should consume a drink or meal with a carbohydrate to protein ratio of about 3 to 1 within 30 minutes of your workout. For example, a good choice is 8 ounces of chocolate milk, which is about 22 grams of carbs and 8 grams of protein. On top of developing muscle strength, you also want to improve your muscle power, or how fast and efficiently you move. 
This is more connected to your activities of daily living and physical function than muscle strength. For instance, when rising from a seated position, try to do it more quickly. When climbing stairs, hold the handrail and push off each step as fast as possible. This teaches your muscles to use strength in a more effective way. A typical progressive resistance training program might include 8 to 10 exercises that target all the major muscle groups, sets of 12 to 15 reps performed at an effort of about 5 to 7 on a 10-point scale. You do these 2 to 3 workouts per week. After you've established a routine, you can progress by decreasing the number of reps per set and increasing the weight or resistance. A good guideline is if you're able to complete at least 8 reps, but no more than 12. As you improve, you can increase your weight by trial and error, but you can stay within the range of 8 to 12 reps. One of the challenges of aging is that in your 40s, life itself makes you less active. Between your career, your spiritual life, your family, your friends, exercise can fall further down on the priority list in your 40s. Creaky, achy joints can also make us become less active with time. Overuse and joint injuries resulting from all the years of exercise may cause you to give up your favorite activity or force you to slow down. And this can contribute to you feeling out of shape. But just keep moving. You don't have to do high-intensity exercises or be extreme in your workouts. Start first by finding something active that you love so that you're more likely to enjoy and stick with it. Consistency is key. After a while, consistency is key. After a while, you can add on challenges and build in resistance. As you're older and you have more responsibilities, you could also feel more stressed. And when you're stressed, your body secretes cortisol. We talked about the harm in chronic cortisol secretion. Constant cortisol secretion can affect your blood sugar levels, make you want to eat more, and choose sugary foods. You then develop fat around the belly due to the excess sugar intake. And a larger waistline is linked to conditions like fatty liver disease, diabetes, and heart disease. So because of the added stress and responsibilities as you get older... I urge you to develop coping strategies and pay attention to how you manage your stress and your mental health early on. According to the Center of Disease Control, depression is more prevalent among women and people aged 40 to 59. So it's important to keep your spiritual connection with the Holy Trinity through prayer and listening to the Word because it gives us so much wisdom and direction as to how to live our lives and how to deal with certain situations. Also take responsibility and practice your relaxation techniques. Practice your breathing exercises, meditation, visualization, yoga, deep muscle relaxation, and learn how to recognize and throw out unhealthy and illogical thought patterns using CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. I went over CBT and breathing exercises in detail in my earlier episodes of Health is Happiness. Also, ensure you stay connected with people who are supportive of you. Cancers. Other than genetics and environment, one important risk factor for cancer is your age. As you get older, your chance for a cancer diagnosis increases. According to the National Cancer Institute, the median age of a cancer diagnosis is 66. But about 5.2% of all new cancers are diagnosed in patients who are quite young, 35 to 44 years of age. Another 14.1% of new cases are diagnosed when people are 55 to 64 years of age. Even though cancer can occur in any person at any age, it's important to be cautious about it once you hit your 40s. It's important to be cautious about it once you hit 40. In your 40s, depending on where you live, make it a priority to stay on top of all regular cancer screening programs that are offered in your age group. These are things like mammograms, colonoscopies, prostate cancer screening. See your family doctor for these important preventive health strategies. The sooner the diagnosis and treatment for cancer, the more likely you're going to get better. So we are out of time today, and that wraps up my health tips for your 40s. So I hope from what we've discussed through Health is Happiness, we can all build healthy habits early on that will prevent so many diseases from happening in the future. 
Okay, take care and join us again next Wednesday for another episode of Health is Happiness. And thank you so much, Dr. Zinni, for another wonderful episode of Health is Happiness. And this is great tips and great things to know. Yeah, I, I am taking more protein intake now than ever. I am eating protein bars. I'm having a lot of meat. A uh, lot of things that are very, very uh, rich in proteins. I am doing my best, right? Because I can feel it too. But it's kind of scary when you say that, you know, every year you're losing a percent of your bo- your 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 uh, muscle mass. So uh, I will be working out even harder every single day to keep my mu- muscle mass up. Either way. So super thankful and grateful once again for these, um, these professional uh, episodes of Health is Happiness. And I hope that you guys are enjoying it too. Everyone, have an amazing office Wednesday service tonight. And we'll see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. <laughs> The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive, you know. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like You know, I'm on the morning star